Many people were immigrating to this country from Eastern Europe and Southern Europe, and this made a number of Americans very nervous. Ethnic groups often set up their own schools here. They published newspapers in their native languages. The deaf community, too, had their own newspapers, their own schools, and their own churches, and used a separate language. So people began to think of deaf people as an ethnic group, a group that should be assimilated into the general population. Parents were deaf. My parents had many uh, deaf friends. Uh, they had an active uh, schedule. We went to the deaf clubs, uh, went to deaf people's homes. It was a natural community for me as a kid growing up. Like a kid who grew up in a uh, immigrant uh, family where many of the friends spoke a different language. Instead of speaking Italian, our family spoke sign. I'm a proud person who happens to be deaf. I don't want to change it. I don't want to wake up and suddenly say, oh my God, I can hear. That's not my dream. It's not my dream. I've been raised deaf. I'm used to the way I am. I don't want to change it. Why would I ever want to change it? Because I'm used to it. I'm happy. To people who can hear, and you ask them, what do you think it would be like to be a deaf person? Then all that they're thinking is, well, I couldn't do this. Can't, 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 can't. They would start listing all the things they can't do. And I don't think like that. Deaf people don't think like that. We think about what we can do. Maybe a person can't see, and is that normal? Maybe it is, and maybe a person walks with a bit of a limp. Perhaps that's normal to one person and not to another. What about left-handedness? Is that abnormal or is that normal? It began thousands of years ago as a simple footpath through the woods. The abundant wildlife and glacial lakes created ample habitat for early Native Americans. The footpath began to widen in the 1600s as French voyagers traveled the area in search of furs. Mining and logging activities in the 1800s finally dubbed this winding stretch as the Gunflint Trail. The trail begins at the edge of Lake Superior and extends 57 miles through a boreal forest connecting the civilized modern world with the Boundary Waters Canoe Area Wilderness. Along the way, you'll find secluded resorts, experienced canoe outfitters, and hospitable bed and breakfasts. The resorts and B&Bs are one of a kind and family owned. Many have been passed along from generation to generation, providing returning guests with unusual continuity. The lodges are classic structures, and most have been built from local resources. The cabins are comfortable and have been designed to blend in with the surrounding ecosystem. Beauty along the Gunflint Trail takes many forms. Hike any of the numerous side trails and you'll end up overlooking vast stretches of water and forest. The Gunflint Trail is one of the few areas in the world where large wildlife greatly outnumber humans. Moose can be found feeding in shallow weedy bays and in the fall during rut, big bull moose can sometimes be called in for close viewing. The Gunflint area also has one of the largest populations of the eastern timber wolf of any area in the lower 48 states. A trip to the Gunflint Trail is complete when you venture into the Boundary Waters Canoe Area Wilderness. Spread out over one million acres, the BWCAW contains over 1,200 miles of canoe routes and over a thousand lakes and streams. Only 2,200 campsites exist in the Boundary Waters, which gives each group of visitors the solitude of a wilderness experience. A knowledgeable outfitter is essential to a safe and enjoyable canoe trip. 
The Gunflint Trail has numerous outdoor professionals who can provide everything from the latest equipment to expert fishing advice. Paddling these waters, listening to wolves howl, and simply being in an area that has changed very little since the glaciers left is an adventure that will never be forgotten. And it can all be found along the Gunflint Trail. In 1977, we had soaring murder rates. We had a city that was really gripped with every form of crime. The city was dirty. It was experiencing an epidemic of arson. It was covered in graffiti. The city was so broke that city services had been cut back profoundly. They laid off 5,000 cops. And they closed firehouses. They laid off thousands of teachers. Nobody knew from day to day whether uh, the Big Apple would become the bankrupt apple. You had to really hold on to your purse. There was an element of danger. Times Square wasn't Disney World. You know, it was great. It was, it was like the Wild West. 1977 was the year of the 25-hour citywide blackout that led to massive looting and, and, in fact, the largest mass arrest in the city's history. And New York City went through one of the most contentious mayoral elections in 1977. And it came to be seen as an election for the soul of the city in the future. People were confused, disillusioned, afraid. All of these emotions were spawning all kinds of music. That was the year that disco exploded in New York. Back in 77, we took hip-hop from the South Bronx, brought it into the club. We never thought it would blow up like it did. Yeah, 1977 was a big year for punk rock. There was a buzz at CBGBs. Everybody wanted to sign punk bands. It was no coincidence that during this period of, of really kind of ultimate decay for New York, it was an incredibly exciting place to be. It was free, it was open, you felt like you could do anything you wanted. Most people thought that New York City's uh, 
great days were over.